Hi guys, welcome to week two. Um, we are covering uh, chapter two, experiencing theater collaboration of actor, audience, and space. I have a lot of notes, really, really, really good notes, really good points for this, but I will try and keep it concise. You are in um, one of the dance studios and uh, private lesson rooms at uh, the dance studio that I own, and I'm hoping that uh, they're having classes out there. I'm hoping nobody comes in to ask me a question. Um, if they do, hopefully we can get back on track without um, me having to record this like five or six more times. All right, so in his inspirational book, The Empty Space, written in 1968, director Peter Brook reminds us that only three elements are necessary for theater to exist. An empty space and person in action in that space being watched by someone else. So, for example, this we could very easily make theater. If I have somebody performing, if I have a couple people watching, um, that is theater. Empty space and people in action being watched by someone else. This could be live theater right here. Whenever one person performs and another watches in the same location, theater is created. Lots of other things might be present, lights, costumes, scenery, makeup, seats, a raised platform, music, predetermined words. Um, the event could incorporate hundreds of actors, thousands of spectators, and millions of dollars, but the basis of theater, the essence of the event, is a theatrical collaboration. One person acting, one person Odding, okay, listening and or watching in the same space at the same time. Um, they break down, um, you know, more about uh, performances and, and what creates theater, and it's really, really powerful. Um, since by definition, the performer and the spectator share the same time and space, a theatrical performance can happen only once okay that's pretty cool it's kind of like um your wedding ceremony right it can it can only happen um once in the sense that you're marrying that one person these people are here that in itself is very much live theater right but it's it's also um you know something that's just kind of like part of our society and what we do um and then they they give you a couple different scenarios but it still doesn't um it still makes that one experience um, very, very, very specific. So the same actors may perform the same text with the same movement for two different audiences, but it is not the same event if different people are watching. Even if the same people attended both performances and the actors said exactly the same words and played the same action, the events could not be identical, okay? So pretty cool, really powerful stuff. Um, every performance is different because human beings are not static. An actress's opening night performance is not the same as her hundredth. A performer who just experienced a painful breakup plays a love scene differently than he did the night before. So um, real life affects the performance um, and real life affects the person spectating, okay? Um, and then they give a couple different uh, explanations of how, and we talked about this in the last lecture, how an audience can affect an actor's performance. One of the um, examples is in the midst of a comedy, actors faced with stony silence might push, they overemphasize lines, they try too hard to be funny, they kill the jokes. Um, where an audience that is ready to laugh can elicit easy, polished delivery from the performers, okay? And, and we talked a little bit last week. You've got, like, your Sunday crowd, the folks that just came from, like, lunch, and they're a little bit drowsy. They know they have to go to work in the morning. Uh, where your Friday and Saturday audiences are typically more lively for whatever reason. All right, so we talk, we start to break down the audience here, okay? At its most basic level, theater provides a sensory experience for the audience. It appeals to the human senses as the audience is actively involved in perceiving, processing, reacting to, and storing a vast number of stimuli. They talk about empathy and aesthetic distance. When you watch a performance, you experience two phenomena simultaneously empathy 
and aesthetic distance. Empathy is emotional identification. In everyday life, it means the ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. In the theater, it refers to a sense of participation and identification with character. It is not the same thing as sympathy. Okay, although that also might be at work, empathy is when you feel along with the characters. Okay, so and not just feel for them. It's the same reason that when we see um, a movie or a TV show that moves us, we cry, right? Because you're not feeling for them, you're feeling along with them. Um, you know, whatever show did they kill off your favorite character and you're watching the other people suffer and. I won't talk about it, but Grey's Anatomy season 10, or season 10, season 11, whatever the most latest season has been, I think you can relate. Uh, those last couple episodes, I, yeah, I'm pretty sure I bawled my eyes out. Um, all right. They give some more examples here about empathy. Marcia Norman's play, Night Mother, written in 1983, focuses on the aging Thelma and her daughter, Jessie. Because of many physical and emotional problems, Jessie decides quite rationally that she would rather be dead than alive and prepares for her suicide as she explains her reasons to her mother. Throughout the play, the audience is pulled back and forth between identifying with Jessie, whose arguments make sense, and with Thelma, who desperately tries to change her daughter's mind. At the play's end, Jessie exits and locks the door behind her as her mother screams and pleads through the closed door. The answer is a gunshot heard offstage. The audience's emotional participation participation in those excruciating moments is intense. Emotional involvement in this play is heightened also by nonstop action. The play has no intermission. All right, they talk more about empathy. It is a key component in many entertainment forms and is sometimes so strong that feeling spills over into action. Have you ever screamed at the climax of a horror film or found your body trying to run the plays while you watched a football game on television? Okay, my husband has this theory that if we're watching a scary movie and he is like moving something, uh, whether it's a hand or like a foot that he won't jump and respond. Okay, so that that is a perfect example of empathy taking over into a physical reaction. They talk about aesthetic distance, which was the second component of that, right? It is a psychological separation or sense of detachment. It is what keeps the audience, usually, okay, from shouting, from trying to influence the action on stage. You understand that what you are watching is not real. Okay, when the lights come back up, the audience members will talk and laugh and go back to their homes and the actors will take off their costumes, put on their street clothes and re-enter daily life. So that is called aesthetic distance. You know that what you're watching, whether it's um, a movie or live theater, is not real. Um, but at the same time, both are necessary for a complete experience. Empathy makes the event exciting and personal aesthetic distance makes analysis possible and allows you to exercise your intellect as well as your feelings. Okay. Um, there's, they go into something else when, when we really start to dive into the actors portion, I'm, we'll talk about this, but, um, this is called breaking the fourth wall and it's basically when, action between uh, actors or characters on stage starts to involve the audience okay they've if you have like if you're on a stage and you have a wall here you have a wall behind you and you have a wall to the side normally you have a fourth wall the actors are just they're doing their thing their characters are playing out the scene and they don't pay attention okay or they're not supposed to pay attention to what the audience is doing. They don't know you're there. You're just viewing. Okay. But when you break a fourth wall, this comes up and you um, speak directly to the audience and oftentimes involve them somehow in the production. Okay. So this is on the other hand, the audience members might be asked to step back from the dramatized world and remember that they are in a theater. Okay. If an actor looks at the audience and addresses it directly, the audience is encouraged to relate to the actor as an actor or perhaps a narrator rather than as the character. Okay. Breaking the fourth wall. Um, they give another example here. Sometimes the consistent manipulation of aesthetic distance can yield surprising results. In the play Miss Margarita's Way, written in 1977, um, 
by Brazilian Roberto Eithod, the leading character, um, is a vocally abusive seventh grade teacher who berates the audience members as if they are junior high students. How would you like that, right? The house lights remain up throughout and the audience is encouraged to talk back to the teacher. When this play is performed, the audience often acts badly, standing, yelling at the stage, throwing things, actually taking on the role of the delinquent students. The playwright, in fact, includes the audience in his list of characters, okay? Um, in Miss Margarita's way, the audience is encouraged to abandon aesthetic distance to some extent and actually become physically involved in the dramatic events. All right, despite the best efforts of the theater artist to control empathy and aesthetic distance, things can happen in production through no one's design or intent that have a profound impact on audience's response. An actor's slip of the tongue or a noise backstage might pull an audience out of the dramatized world at an inopportune moment. A person who has experienced an event similar to one depicted on the stage might identify so strongly with the character Sara that sadness overwhelms any possibility of analyzing the performance from an objective point of view. This audience member has little distance from his or her own sorrowful experience and therefore can create none for the performance. I'm sure we've all been to a show. I um, saw the musical Pippin that toured actually when it was in Charlotte, North Carolina. And it's an interesting show in general, but there was, in the second act, there were a couple moments where the actors completely broke character and laughed. At each other and the show kind of stalled for a couple of minutes and of course this made the audience laugh because you have two people on stage who are honestly genuinely laughing but I went home and my husband went home and we were like okay I don't know to, if I should call that unprofessional or it just it was a negative connotation for us because we were even more confused about the show or what it was about. So, you know, this can be used in a positive or negative way, and in our situation, it was a negative way. Sometimes things happen, and the drama of it actually, it creates an even better show. A director will be like, okay, whatever you did, keep it in there, because that was incredible. Um, they go into another little segment here, the overall effect on the audience. Um, they go into a little theater history here. For centuries, people have speculated about the desired effect of theatrical performance on the audience, and many theories exist. The Greek philosopher Aristotle, 384 to 322 BC, used the word catharsis, or emotional release. A performance was designed to engage the audience's feelings and build in intensity so that the spectator felt cleansed or purged of strong emotion by the end of the play. Okay, so that was... Aristotle's thoughts on how, um, on what theater did for an audience. However, in the 20th century, the German playwright and theorist Bertolt Brecht, 1898-1956, rejected the cathartic model altogether, okay, right, Aristotle, you're great, but you're wrong, and insisted that the function of theater should be to appeal to the intellect of the audience and incite it to social action, okay? Um, and then they go into uh, Japanese no theater. NOH embraces an end result of contemplation rather than action or emotional release. So this is the Japanese no theaters theory. Okay, the playwright and theorist Zimi described the ideal image of performance as a flower, a perfect transitory beauty, an enigmatic and mysterious elegance. The actor should strive to create an unfading flower despite its temporary nature. The flower should always surprise the audience and reveal the unexpected. Another little segment, the nature of acting. At the most basic level, every human being who interacts with other human beings is an actor. So all of y'all who um, commented on the discussion post introducing yourself saying, I don't know, I just had to have this class, um, you know, because it's a, it's a fine arts credit or whatever, guess what? You are an actor. If you are a human being, you are an actor. Every person performs social roles for others, both consciously and unconsciously. All right. Psychologists and psychiatrists from Sigmund Freud onward have explored the role playing of the human animal in order to better understand behavior, to examine internal conflicts, and to treat emotional problems. And going back to everybody is an actor. You know, when when you guys in life 
uh, when you're with your kids, your mom, right? That's that's who you are. Your um, your actions change. Your verbiage changes. Everything changes. Your mom. When you're with your spouse, your husband or wife, right? That action changes. When you're at work, your employee or employer or whatever, right? And in this situation, your student. I'm teacher. Okay, so. Um, that's just a couple of examples of how every human being is an actor and what roles you put on, okay, or what masks, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, playwrights often demonstrate that people perform different roles when interacting with different friends, acquaintances, family members, and strangers. People perform differently in private situations than they do in public, right? Social performance is a basic phenomenon of human behavior and is central to the dramatic content and conflict of the theatrical experience. All right, knowing that, is it then surprising that an early Greek word for the actor is hypocrites, okay, from which we glean uh, the more negative words hypocrisy, okay? Um, as early as the fourth century, Aristotle identified mimesis or the actor or the artist's process of imitating character and action as so basic to humanity that it was necessary to invent theater. For example, children love to play roles and often use imitation to learn to speak, to mimic grown-ups, and to understand the world around them. Okay, how many times have you had your child or maybe you know another child in your life say something that you've told them and you're like where did you where did you learn that oh my gosh you learned them that from me they mimicked you okay mimesis um participation in theatrical production gives sanction to this sense of play okay basically theater is just like adults with like big imaginations. <laughs> um, for those who choose to create theater for an audience, the process of mimesis is not merely copying, but creating and recreating from the observation and analysis of human models of character and action from the exploration of self. Here, mimesis becomes an art form to be studied, practiced, and refined by both playwrights and actors. In the ancient Roman theater, the persona was the mask of the actor. Okay, once we get into, um, that's actually a Greek tragedy, but Oedipus um, involves masks. All right, and we'll, we'll get into more of that later on. But um, we now more commonly use the word mask, or I'm sorry, persona, to designate psychologically the social role a person is playing or presenting in life. Both of these meanings are appropriate to the process of the actor assuming a character. The actor dons a mask, whether literal or figurative, and when the preparation is complete, the audience is asked to accept this masked actor as the character designated by the play. Okay? And part of the reason, you know, they used masks um, in Greek tragedies and comedies is that they were in a big amphitheater and so they couldn't see even if you were like larger than life they couldn't see facial expressions so you needed huge masks that were like three times the size of a person's face to be able to know okay that person that character that mask is angry that mask is sad that mask is happy now um, we use makeup primarily, okay, to accentuate um, features and all of that. Uh, frequently, however, the mask is figurative through language that was conceived not by the actor but by a playwright through movement unlike the actor's own by presenting action that is contradictory to the actor's beliefs or normal behavior. The identity and personality of the actor are concealed from the audience while the actor simultaneously reveals a truthful picture of the character, okay? They talk about the process from play to production. All right, while some theatrical performances progress through improvisation, the performers make up the words or movements as they go along, most theater begins with a written text. One writer or group of writers creates the play or script, okay, a written text indicating the words, the characters speak, and some of the physical action. In doing so, the writer provides the basic action of the play. He or she decides the major events of the play, the basic nature of each character, and the exact words that will be spoken on stage. 
The play is then brought to life by a team of theater artists, a director, actors and designers, and theater technicians. This team creates the theatrical production, the fully realized performance of the play with actor sets, costumes, lighting, and props. All right, so they talk about production collaborators. Historically, the work of creating a production has been divided in various ways. Accounts from ancient Greece say that the playwright staged their own work. All right, in 18th century Europe, a leading performer dubbed an actor manager organized the presentation of a play. Many theaters in the 21st century share a basic division of artistic duties. We will refer to the following job titles many times in uh, this book or uh, in this class. All right. So typically, although by no means exclusively, contemporary production begins with a script created by a playwright or author. Okay, the financial and business aspects of the production are handled by a producer. Okay, somebody who believes in um, the product that the playwright has created and says, hey, I want to help put this on stage. Let me get all the money for you. All right, the producer usually negotiates the rights to a play and hires a director who is in charge of the artistic aspects of production. It is the director's job to guide the transformation of the play to live production. Basically, they get the picture, that the, the intention that the playwright um, has for the script, and they bring that to life, all right? Often the director, although sometimes the producer, chooses the actor, sometimes assisted by a casting director, okay? That's their job to cast, and the director always helps the actors to develop and refine their characterizations, all right? In that, you have a scenic designer who creates a visual home for the play on stage. They, with the director, with the playwright, create all the visual, what you see, all right? Um, the costume designer creates the wearable scenery for the actors to help define and express character, and a lighting designer influences the effect of all visual elements by controlling focus and mood with color, placement, and intensity of light. A sound designer, okay, creates acoustic and recorded sound. On some occasions, a makeup designer may join the production team. A musical, okay, adds a composer, a lyricist who creates the music and lyrics, a music director who works with the singers and the orchestra, a choreographer, that's what I do a lot of the time, okay, who stages the dancing. And then in a medium to large size theater, the creative decisions made by this team are executed, executed by a stage manager who ensures that things run smoothly on stage and backstage and management staff, a scene shop crew, a costume shop crew, and a lighting crew. All right. So that is just the creative aspect and then putting the production up. Okay. But you have another team. This is your front of house personnel. Theater operations that deal directly with the audience are called front of house, okay? Typically, you don't have an actor taking your tickets, right? They're backstage getting ready. You have um, a ticket master or somebody doing that. The house manager is responsible for the safety and comfort of the audience members during their time in the theater. The box office manager, okay, that's your second guy, works directly with the house manager and is responsible for organizing and overseeing ticket sales, including supervising the staff members who deal directly with the public. The front of house personnel acts as a liaison between the audience and production and have an influence on the pleasantness of the patron's experience. All right, they talk about the rewards of collaboration. Making theater requires tremendous amounts of work. Okay, so what is the attraction for those human beings who step out of the audience to go on or backstage? Basically, why would you choose, you know, to give up your time knowing that you may not get paid what you need to get paid to produce this kind of work, all right? Perhaps most obviously, theater provides a forum for self-expression. Many possibilities exist for artistic outlet, not only acting and directing, but also designing, lighting, sound, scenery, costumes, and makeup, as well as drawing, painting, sewing, building, writing, and composing. All right, so it's a way to express yourself. 
And I think they don't talk much about this, but the camaraderie of a cast is really important. And you go through so much and see each other so often that they become a part of your family. They become, in essence, if you were um, touring, they become your family for however long you know that you're on the road for. And they go through things with you, um, breakups, losing people injuries, lots of things, and, and they become the people that you rely on. And I think that that is another reason why people choose this art as well. Um, one of the most satisfying aspects of working in the theater is collaboration. All right, so we just talked about that first with other artists, technicians, and administrators, and finally with the audience. It is, it is important to keep in mind that no one in the theater creates in a vacuum. All right, this is not a like one person job. Each person contributes um, a part of the whole and that part is successful and valid only insofar as it is appropriate to the, ex the success of the entire production. Everybody is so important. Things start crumbling if you have one person who doesn't care or you know doesn't want to do it. It's, it's all so important. Um, so then they start breaking down uh, some of the spaces and they have cool diagrams but I'm Kind of made some notes of maybe places that you've been that describe the the types of theaters that there are you have a proscenium space if you attend the theater with regularity it is likely that you have encountered a proscenium space frequently all right invented by the italians in a temporary form in the 16th century and for permanent structures by the 17th the proscenium theater is most clearly defined by a large open arch okay the proscenium arch that makes the primary division between audience and performance space. A proscenium space may have an apron, so um, more space that extends out front of the proscenium. Uh, and most proscenium theaters also have wings, spaces off stage left and right for actors, crew, and scenery that are not visible for performance space. Okay, so examples of a proscenium stage would be TPAC. They would also be Vol State. Um, they would be Center for the Arts in Murfreesboro. All right, all those are proscenium stages. Um, and then sometimes, you know, depending on um, the the type of, you know, TPAC has a grand drape. They have a curtain. This isn't always the case, um, but a lot of your bigger proscenium uh, theaters do have that. Uh, the audience area of the theatrical space is called the house. Okay, so if you hear the terms like, we have a full house tonight, you know, it means like we were packed, every seat was full. In a proscenium theater, the orchestra is the space immediately in front of the stage where seats are on the floor. The theater might also have an orchestra pit. Traditionally, a sunken area between the apron and the audience for musicians. Usually, the orchestra floor is gently raked, slowing upward from stage or pit to the back of the house. So, basically, the audience sits like this at an incline so that everybody can see the stage. Um, a lot of the European theaters had a raked stage. So, performers were on a stage that had a slant. Um, these are very, very hard to perform on, and the stories of people dancing and wiping out are so many. Anyway, uh, somewhere they decided, hey, this is not working, so why don't why don't we rethink this and then let's let's make the audience raked. Uh, your so that was a proscenium space. You have a thrust space. The thrust space is one of the oldest theatrical arrangements to be formalized as theater architecture. All right, and that is where. Um, instead of the proscenium arch, you have a stage, and then you have a facade, which is your background right behind the stage. There's no kind of little box or overhang. Um, an example of this would be the globe. The London Globe is a thrust stage. You have an arena space, okay? The arena space is the easiest to describe, but one of the most difficult to use well. Quite simply, it is a space in which the audience completely surrounds the performance area. The stage could be square, rectangular, circle, circular, trapezoidal, in fact, any geometric shape, but a circle, circular arena space is sometimes called theater in the round, okay? So that's, you've got people in the center and then you have an audience all the way around like a Bridgestone arena or whatever it's called now. Um, that is uh, an arena space. They talk about black box, one type of non-traditional theater space, maybe quickly uh, 
that may be quickly becoming a traditional one, the term black box at one time described a simple room transformed to a theater space usually painted black. A lot of times for a black box you have, they've taken any type of room they can, they put a stage in the corner and then at least three sides, two to three sides of it are um, uh, allow an audience to sit down. The other side is like the entrance and exit. So if you've been to Hendersonville Performing Arts Company, that is a black box theater. Found theater spaces. A non-traditional theater space is often a found space but need not be that exclusive. A found space is anywhere indoors or out that was never intended as a theatrical space when created or designed. Okay? It can be anywhere. Um, you also have site-specific performance uh, is a term used for production that is developed for and closely linked to a particular location, okay? So sometimes, um, you know, just as it said, a production is developed to be done around the fountain in the park, you know what I mean? And so then that, that would be part of a found theater space, but it's not a traditional theater space. Environmental theater. One of the most dynamic uses of non-traditional space is often called the environmental theater. The basic principle of environmental theater is that the audience and actors share the same space. There is little or no separation of acting and observing areas with the result that the audience members are physically part of the performance. Okay. Ah. Uh. They go into stage direction, and instead of reading this to you, I'm just going to explain it. All right, so keep in mind that if you are on stage, your directions are very different than if you are sitting in the house. All right, so I'm going to turn this way, and I want us to pretend that we're on a stage. If I have uh, your four different directions, you have upstage, downstage, stage right, stage left. Okay, so remember we're on a stage, the piano and all of this is our audience, okay? If my director tells me to move downstage, I am moving down towards the director. They come from the, uh, when theaters were raked, you literally would walk downstage or upstage. So this is downstage. If my director says move stage right, I move to my right, but it's my director's left. If he says move stage left, I move this way. If he says move upstage, I move back to where I came from. That is if I'm on a stage, okay? If I am in the house, okay, you're, um, you still have downstage and upstage. So um, upstage, move back. Downstage, move forward. House left is stage right and house right is stage left. I hope that kind of makes sense there. Um, anyway, that is chapter two. You have a discussion um, question that should be responded to by Thursday at 11.59 p.m. and please respond to two other classmates and then have a fabulous Labor Day.